All right, so first question is, Tamara, for new agents, do you think it's more beneficial to initially join a team rather than working individually? If you work individually but participate in coaching, do you think that's it? Just as Do you think it's just as beneficial as being on a team? What I can say is, Tamara, I pretty much know every one of the top teams in America. They're either independent or they in real, they're in real trends or Tom Ferry. I've met them at some point of time at EXP or at a whatever conference. I know all of their models. I know everything about teams. And I got a whole level. I think it's level three that will be literally just talking about teams. But here's the thing about a team. You have to make sure that you have the right foundation in place and that the team is healthy before you bring someone into that, right? Because it's a big responsibility when you bring someone into a team and even when you join a team. So what we got to decide is, do you want to join a team? And if you join a team that's telling you, oh, you got a door knock. Well, that's totally opposite of what I'm teaching you. If you notice, there's not one time I've ever talked about door knock. It's not my model. I don't believe in door knock. I'm not hating on it. It's just not something that I do. I just think it's weird for people to knock on your door and start asking about real estate. So to answer your question, it's got to be the right team with the right systems that you can plug into. And it's got to be sufficient enough to where it makes sense for you to pay extra commission because most teams are going to have you on a 50-50 split. Some teams even have people on 40-60s. And then some teams even have them on base salaries like 25K and then they're on 1090s. So I've seen it all. So what I would encourage you to do is make sure it's the right team that's going to help you because if they don't have all the systems in place, you can't just plug in day one and start doing deals. That's the thing about anybody that joins my personal team, they know. You just come in and do what I say within the first couple of weeks. I'd say three weeks tops. You're going to have deals under your belt. So just make sure you understand that difference. And um, But I would just double down on the coaching. You've already made the investment. Okay. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. But I was just wondering if it'd be more beneficial. So, But I guess it depends on the person, their personality, and all of that as well. So thank you. I appreciate that. Yeah, I would say the team. And then what is your ultimate goal? Like, do you want to be a top producer? Do you want to grow your own team? You know, really understand what that means. And and when you join a team, does they do, do they give you brand awareness? Because everybody know you join my team here. You get immediate credibility. You don't have to do one transaction. You say TM5 here, you walk right into a billion dollar list, literally, hands down. Does it have that brand awareness and that value? And just really understand, like, do they have transaction coordinators? I got a whole presentation here. Let me, this is what you need to do. I, I think it's on my Instagram. I'll look it up. It's uh, right where you see me and my wife pointing at the EXP sign, sprint, okay. EXP sprint, right to the next of it. That's that presentation. Watch that. It'll change It'll change a lot for you when you're thinking about a team. Awesome. Thank you. I appreciate it. Yes, ma'am. All right, let's get to the next questions. Thank you for submitting that, though. All right, Teresa, I'm working with a buyer who likes a house that's not currently for sale. I look more into the property and it's in a trust. Can you coach me on what questions to ask on how to handle being in a trust? Yes. So, Teresa, if it's in a trust, it's not, it doesn't really change much for you as the realtor. So, like, me and Erica had our house, which you know about and, and seen. That's That was in a trust. So, it was just, you know, Black Wolf Trust. So, the trust doesn't really... It'll change some things for the attorney and the, and the title and all that stuff. But from a negotiation standpoint, that's just a holding entity. No different than an LLC. So... You'll just have to get some of that stuff on the backside. But if you're just negotiating with an agent or the people that have the trust, it's not going to change much for you. And if it's not a blind trust, you can look up the information and get, and get in contact with them. OK, yeah, I just I didn't know if there was like different steps I needed to take or um, if I needed to know something that maybe I wasn't looking up. But thank you for that. Yes, ma'am. All right, Jabari. Jabari is consistent. He gets them questions in. I've decided to focus on single family investing in College Station. And do you mind if I say this number? Or are you good? It, it, it's good. I'm good. That boy Jabari said he's going to hit $5 billion in, on this niche. And I'm just joking with you, bro. So you want to hit $5 <laughs> million on this niche. What insight or feedback could you give me when focusing on this area? I would just say you double down. When you're thinking about investing, guys, we always got to even niche even more. So if you're going to go into the stock market, right? Are you going for blue chip stocks or penny stocks? Are you going for stocks that pay dividends? Or are you going for companies that were private owned and went public last week, right? So just niche down on it. Are you going for land deals? So locations first. Are you going for student housing? If you're doing student housing, are you going for value add or not? Single family, new construction. So I would just say niche down on your investing 
and say, okay, I'm just going to focus on niching down on family rentals, rentals that I can do three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine year leases, or not even eight year leases, but renewals year over year versus student housing, you know, is very fluid. Every 12 to 24 months, these kids are moving out, make ready, more kids moving in. Or is it development? You know, that's where I built, that's where I cut my teeth and buying dirt and development. I'm sitting in front of a project right now. I'm trying to get done because I'd much rather have the dirt and build it myself because then I know what I'm what I own and I know what I I know what I'm holding in my portfolio. Any other questions on that? No, no, that's good. So basically I just need to determine now as now I know single family, just determine that niche and then um just basically dive deep on that one. I got it. Yeah, I think the misnomer for most people is when you see an entrepreneur or somebody so-called successful, y'all know I think that word is very fluid because what does successful even mean? Um, to me, if success isn't, st- is, if it's not tied to a statistic, then a person doing one deal a year could be successful, right? Because what if it's a billion dollar transaction? But some, some may say, well, you only did one transaction and look down on that person until they realize it's a billion dollar deal every year. So what I would say is, just really understand like what is the what what are you trying to accomplish and how do you niche down on it to where you can bring value into that space and do something fresh and different like when i started tearing down this stuff in college station nobody was doing it at the time nobody was doing four fours and five fives and it worked so just find where you can add value to the market be creative guys if i could challenge y'all on anything be creative when you're creative and you bring something new and you stand beside it and you stand behind it it's all people love fresh and new shit. That's why the iPhone just came out yesterday. There's a new one next week. They just like new stuff. So what are you bringing different to the market versus the same OBS that every other realtor saying? So you got to be fresh and new and you got to add something different. Like right now, I'm looking at buying a track of land and doing tiny homes on it and doing Airbnb of like a whole community of tiny homes because we don't have it. All right. Yo, can, so, I say, can I say that? I was actually thinking about that. So hearing that makes me i was just like huh that's i didn't know if it was a good idea but that that's pretty cool that you're doing it too so we got we got time the beautiful thing is we got through all our questions we got through our check-in all in you know 30 minutes we still got 30 minutes so it's open floor let's just talk through the course let's talk through whatever questions y'all have and let's keep growing and being great cool i got a question for the um so you know you have tons of companies that need to develop uh, i would say you know when you go to some of them that have lots of competition. Um, as soon as you start, uh, how do you kind of make yourself uh, sort of like, let's say your roofing company or plumbing company, how do you compete with someone that's already well-established in the market? Well, that's practically what I've done for 16 years. Every one of my companies had no brand. No one knew what TM5 was when I started it, right? Now we got 50 agents in Houston that just joined under the brand. So it's like, you just got to double down on some of the things I always talk to y'all about. What's your uni? I'm telling you, that's what I'm telling y'all. Y'all probably think I sound like a broken record. It'd be no different than if you came to me and wanted to play a receiver. I'm not going to show you all the fun and sexy stuff that sounds cool that you see people dancing in the end zone. I'm going to show you how to truly get open and how to score touchdowns. And it's not going to be fun. It's not going to be cool. It's just grind. You want to do it the same way that you're entering the real estate space. You look at your competition. You study them. You see what they're doing. You see what their value proposition is. You look at their pricing. Look at their branding. Look at their websites. Look at their social media. And I'm telling you, like, there's something in, like, it's it's like, it's almost like when I would line up and see a defensive back. The worst thing DBs knew is not to look me in my eyes. They looked me in my eyes, they were done. Because I can see through your soul. I know if you don't want to cover me or not. And the whole game, they were, you already know what it is. So in business, I love social media now because I can look in the eyes of the business owner through their videos, through their marketing, through their value proposition, through their reviews. And I know if they want to compete with me or not. And that's just the competitive nature you got to carry. Listen, I I hear people say all the time, well, you're too competitive. What does that even mean? Like, I want to win. It had nothing to do with, that's what I'm saying. None of it. Yeah, now the byproduct of winning is income and success and notoriety and, and, and to be able to feed your family. Great. But I didn't start doing any of this for any of that. I just want to win. So the mentality you got to carry is how can I compete every day with myself first? Your biggest competitor is the person in the mirror. I'm telling you when these courses are dropped, all of them, you guys will literally have not one excuse on why you're not successful because it works. I'm literally giving you the game 
No one's ever going to break down real estate sales the way this course will be when it's completed. I've studied every course out there. There's people selling real estate courses who just got their license 30 days ago. There's people selling real estate courses who've never even done a real estate transaction. The game is this. How do you compete in the market? Like read the book, Good to Great. It's a really good book. Talks about how these major companies have competed and stayed viable year over year. Business is warfare. We got to remember that. If you think true war is bad, yes, there's people dying. It's bad. You think sports is competitive? Business is warfare, man. People are fighting tooth and nail for market share every day. And that's the mentality you got to get up with. And if it's not, then you got to get out of real estate sales. You need to go be a transaction coordinator for somebody or go be a listing coordinator or go be an administrative person because only the, only the strong survive in sales in any industry. There's two things that we got to double down on. We got to figure out. Did you do the personality profile yet? Yeah. Do you know where you're at on the wheel? Mm-hmm. Relator? Okay. Uh, yeah, I can read people pretty well. If you let me talk to you for 10 minutes, I know who you are on the wheel. So what, what you're struggling with is the C, the compliant part, and the S, which is the steady part. You don't mind doing it, but you want to be building relationships and being active. So what you got to do is, because you know what anything, right? Like EXP is more of an entrepreneurial. It's got the high splits. It gives you that meat on the bone on your transactions to try to go and hire out. Versus some brokers will do it for you, but then they take more of your commission, right? So it's just a trade-off. It's, and so what we got to do is, the, the beautiful thing is that trade-off is once you build it over time, then you still get to keep benefiting from the higher splits or you pay it out in some way, shape, form, or fashion to a broker or a team leader. But either way, you can't bypass it. So what we got to do is we got to get you a virtual assistant. You got to make the investment because you've made it clear that you do not want to do this stuff. And so we got to get you a VA and I got that company that you can tell them what you need. Like we have signed templates, but if you don't want to use ours, then you got to create one, right? EXP has a hundred signed templates, but if you don't want to use theirs, then you got to create one. So it's just really deciding, okay, what's important to me and what's not. If you want to create your own sign, then this, you got to take the time to do it. If not, use a TM5 one. If you don't want a TM5, use an EXP one. You see what I'm saying? And don't, don't overwhelm yourself. So just say, okay, my ultimate goal right now is to get help. Cause you can talk to Carrie all day, but she's going to, I'm going to, I'm going to tell you what you need. You see what I'm saying? She's not going to be able to tell you anything I can't tell you. So what we got to do is we got to, it's the same thing. Like I'm out on this project right now. It's way behind. I'm just running to get it done. I mean, when I tell you I'm working 80 hours, 85 hours a week, I'm not exaggerating. Probably longer to be honest. Um, but there's three pods. They're all behind. And my superintendent kept trying to push forward all of them at the same time. And I realized, I was like, no, just tackle one. Just get one done. So put all your energy on just one building. Get it done. Get the tenants moved in. Now let's go tackle the second building. And when I made that pivot, we just did in five days what probably takes four to five weeks in construction because we just put our energy into just getting one done. So that's what I would tell you if you say, okay, I have signs. I have a VA. I got this. Just literally write out a to-do list. Okay, this is your homework. Write out at least 20 things that you need to get done. If 20 overwhelms you, do five. If five doesn't feel enough, do 100. That's where your personality has to step up and decide what, what is what. But write out a list of to-do, then rank them. Most important to least important. Then once you do that, then say, I'm going to tackle these five. I'm just going to do one a day. And that first most important may be finding a virtual assistant that can then turn around and you can say, here's my vision for my, my signs. Here's how I want to set up my postcards for my listings. And then you just assign them a project every day and then you manage that person. But remember, everything in life, I'm going to say this, this is really important. This is a God thing, Sure, We always have God conversations. Just because you bring on that other person doesn't mean that that responsibility goes away. It's just a new responsibility. So remember, when you level up, the responsibility doesn't, it doesn't evade you. It's just now, now you have a responsibility of making sure that your assistant knows what to do every week. Now, the goal is to get them self-sufficient to where you can leverage it. So you see what I'm saying? So that core thing of time blocking and then you're still going to have to time block when you bring in a new person because now you got to set aside some time to give her her assignments every week. So you see what I'm saying? N nobody likes doing anything when you're building. So just remember that, right? Like, I don't want to be out here looking at these construction sites, talking to the painters on why they splash paint on the wall and all that kind of BS, right? But I'm willing to do it for a season. Because when I turn around, these 14 townhomes are going to produce me 350000 a year in gross commission income. But 
I'm out here working. Literally, my kids are like, where's dad? Because they know I come home every night. Like, I'm at home by 5 or 6 o'clock. So, but I'm in this season where I'm having to leave, be back out here till 9 at night to get it done. It's not, it's not forever, but it's the sacrifice I'm willing to make right now to get where I'm trying to go. So what you got to decide is, okay, what sacrifice do I need to make over the next two days, two weeks, two months, or two years to get this shit off my plate I don't like doing? And get to where I need to go. So give yourself those deadlines and say, all right, let's let's take the to-do list, rank it out, and then I will have a virtual assistant hired and ready to go by the end of August or by next Friday, whatever it takes. And then you time block, like you said, what you want to do. So remember, go on my website. I have those different vendors set up and I already got the prices negotiated for y'all. So if you go on my website and look at the free resources, click on that tab. It's in the bottom in the footer. I got the link to the VA company that will help you build out not only a process for your VA, but a job description for them. And then you don't have to build a job description. You just say, here's all the stuff I don't want to do. And they'll say, okay, because they have process engineers. It's one of the only VA companies I've ever dealt with that's got a process engineer that helps you build out the process. So I would encourage you to do that. It's it's a really, uh, it's it's worth every penny. Well, that's on you, Cheryl. You got to look in the mirror. Remember, your worst enemy is you. So, okay, like we talked about earlier, if another broker is doing it, then they're going to charge you for it. Just like I'm doing a lot for my personal team, but I'm charging them for it. They're getting so much value, leads, phones, transaction coordinators, listing coordinators, whatever, whatever, but they're paying for it. So you're going to pay for it or with your time. Or Remember, you always hear me say sweat equity or check equity. So you're going to do it with your time, with your sweat. I'm out here right now with my sweat. Or are you going to pay for it? Period. And it, there's no way around it. So what what you can't do is you can't, like you said, be cheap and then not be willing to do the work. It don't work that way. You can't be you can't be on both sides of that. The line in the sand, like I'm not going to not only not pay for it, but I'm just not going to do it. Well, then don't work for sure. Sweat. Remember what I've said on the course, sweat equity or check equity. It's it's one of the most fundamental things I learned early on as an entrepreneur. Nobody taught me that. I didn't read that in a book. I literally sat down and looked at it. at that time. We had like five businesses. And obviously now we're north of 20 uh, or, or 50. But the point is, I just said, damn, why do I keep running into this? And in the beginning, there was the biggest lesson I learned. I started a retail business at like 24 years old. And I was just throwing money at it. billboards, ads in the newspaper, ads on TV. And, and, and I was like, why is it not being successful? And I really understood that principle of check equity or sweat equity. You really got to know and understand when it's time, but you, you can't not do either one or you will not be successful in business because, yeah, if you sit back and say, I'm not going to do it, I don't want to do it. So now you're not giving me sweat. And then you're like, I'm not going to hire anybody. Well, then you're not going to be successful. I can tell you that now. So look into that, look into that company. If you want, you got to do it or you got a time block and you got to get out here and build a town home yourself. Right. You got to do it. I mean, most people would say, how the hell are you out here on this project yourself? Because I'm ensuring that it's getting done. And I know I'm not doing it forever. I'm doing it for six weeks. You know what I mean? So whatever it takes. Yes, ma'am. Always. Next question. Hey, Murph, I got a question. So the, that, that project you had right now, you talked a little bit about it, but can you walk me through like when you drove down that street and you said, okay, I'm about to build. I don't know how to look like. And I know some of that is a God thing. You can visualize things. But can you take me back to when that whole lot was trailer park boats? And help you. How did you calculate that this will return this amount of income, or where and what, where in that process did you realize? Oh, this is what my turn was going to be. Was it from the beginning or as you started? Honestly, at this point in my career, bro, I don't I don't do spreadsheets anymore. Like for me on my personal deals, I, I do my cost estimates. I do my cost estimates. I I know what I can build them for. I know what I can lease them for, and I know about what my return is. You know what I mean? Like for me, I don't even get too caught up in that. Uh, now, will I show it to you guys in the course? Then yes. But on this deal, like I knew what I was paying for for dirt, which when I started in this game, I was paying about seventy five thousand to eighty grand for dirt. Now that same dirt's going for four hundred k. So that area just blew up by Kyle Field. I mean, there's million dollar properties now. So I knew the numbers didn't work there, and I just honestly pray I walked a lot. And then I put together some numbers in my mind. But at this point, I don't need to do some long spreadsheet. I, I said, OK, if I get this many lots at this price, that's going to put my dirt value at 45K per lot. Well, shit, it's not rocket science. I don't care who you are. If you can't make money on paying 40 grand for dirt per lot, 
You see what I'm saying? So I just knew that the numbers made sense based on my lot. That's why it's all about land. Really understand your land. Your land pricing is going to be the key to everything. Location and land. So that's the key. And then just understanding where you want to go with it on the backside. Are you wanting to sell it off? Like I can flip these right now, but I'm not in the business of flipping. That's short-term money that you're going to pay capital gain taxes on. Everything I do is the long game. I don't do anything short-term. Gotcha. And what is the estimate like it takes for you to build something like that? I think we're at about probably about eighty-five or ninety-five dollars a foot per unit. I'd say maybe a hundred dollars a foot. Density is the key, though. Density is the oh. key. And uh, are you just gonna add on those townhomes down on two hundred seven and two hundred five? Yep. Like I tell y'all in clubhouse all the time, if you get the dirt and you get density, then you can literally build out your density enough to where you cannot lose. What's the density there? Fifty beds, right at fifty beds, I believe. Once it's all done, it'll be way more than that. But this phase one. All right, I saw uh, anything else to buy there before I go to Shunston. For tracking market conditions, are you only reviewing MLS reports daily or are you finding other sources of market conditions somewhere else? Yeah, I try to stay out of the news because the news gets, think about it, y'all. The local news or CNN, that's why they call it CNN, constant negative news. I don't watch anything like that because they make money by telling you all the horrific things that happen every day. And it'll have you in a gloomy state. So I never had the time. I didn't have cable in my room growing up. And when I went to college, I never had cable. So me watching TV, it just, it, it's not a habit. So the point is focus on things that are based on facts and not politics. Because when something's based on politics, there's always a spin. And that's why I love data because data doesn't really give a damn if you are Democrat or Republican, black or white, girl or boy, the data is the data. So I just try to focus on statistical stuff you know, like tracking lumber prices or understanding who's buying, like the statistic of uh, 28% of the homes in Texas in 2021 were bought by private equity firms. But that's something important to know. And that's why everybody's like, well, the market's going to turn. Yeah, it'll slow down. It'll simmer. But if a third of the houses are being bought by private equity and they're sitting on billions of dollars of cash that they raised up front, that's what we got to remember. They're not syndicating this money. They have billions of dollars sitting in their account. They have to put it to work for their investors. So if the market turns, what do you think they're going to do? They're going to buy more of the houses. That number is going to go from 28% to probably 39%. Before we know it, they may be buying 50% of the houses because they're going to keep buying. So I would just say focus on anything that can feed you statistical data. CNBC usually isn't political. Bloomberg is a good one. Wall Street's a good one. Um, just finding, finding um, outlets like that. Obviously, Trek takes, or your state commission. Ours is T-R-E-C, and then um, the National Realtors Association, NAR. So I just try to focus on statistical data. And then the last thing for us, the, f- the place that puts out all of our Texas real estate data is actually here at A&M. So Texas A&M actually does all of the statewide st- statistics for our whole state, which is crazy to me. It's like five minutes from my office. So I try to track all their data they put out all the time. All right, let's keep it moving. Let's go. We got time. Let's keep firing off. So, Mark, when you buy uh, investments, is all of it finance or a portion of it finance? Like the land, do you buy the land cash and then finance the building? I usually try to leverage. Remember, OPM, you're going to get a higher return through leverage. I'll give you two ways to look at it. If you buy land, let's say a hundred thousand dollar property and put down a hundred grand, and then I buy that same track, we rent it the exact same, but you own yours cash, and I le- and I leverage mine. I'm gonna have a higher rate of return on my cash. Now you will have ba- you will have better cash flow because you have no note, but my cash is actually making more money than yours. That's the game we got to understand. Why the rich get richer and why the wealthy get wealthier because they understand leverage and we got to understand that. Can you explain that that your cash is making more money? Yes, ma'am. So it's a thing called assets liability equals leverage. It's a formula. And so I'll break it down. Right now, if you see a Starbucks, do y'all, I bet everybody in here has been to Starbucks, right? But did you know they were all privately owned? Mm. The real estate? Did y'all know that? I did. So corporate only keeps a couple of them if they're trying out a new floor plan, but most of them are owned by people like me. Like that we buy the Starbucks and I own the real estate. I don't run the business. I just own, I just own, the, I just own the, the building and they pay me rent. Now, the point is, there's so much opportunity out here for us. We just got to open our minds up. That's why I'm trying to get y'all to get this real estate stuff 
and get the sales where it needs to be and get the income where it needs to be and get the principles on where it needs to be so that I can graduate y'all into the investment piece. That's where we hit it. That's why I call it billion dollar real estate agent sales, then billion dollar real estate investor, which is investing and then entrepreneurship. I'm finna walk y'all through this thing, man. Like I'm literally not going to leave one note, one step, one detail off. And if it does come up, I'm going to make sure I added it back in there. So if you go buy a Starbucks right now and it's for sale, let's just say for a million dollars and it's got a 10 year lease with four or five year renewals is usually what Starbucks does. And it's a triple net. Triple net means that you're probably on the hook for the, the structure of the building and the foundation. Every other thing on the maintenance side, they're going to handle it. So if they have it for sale at a five cap, so when you see five and then you see a percentage sign, that means they're selling it at a five cap. If you pay cash, Chauncey, for that, you're going to make 5% on your million dollars. So you're going to make 5% on your million dollars. Now, if I buy it, I would put down 20%. So let's just say 200 grand. I'm going to go and get debt on the 800K. So the difference between my note and my cash now, when I leverage that 5% cap rate, now I'm probably making 11% on my money because I only put in 200 grand. So just remember, there's two games to play in this real estate investing. One, which is a cash on cash return, cash on cash. When you put debt in in less cash, you get a higher return. So, all right, let me tell you, say it this way too. So if I, if, if Takar gives me $5, and I told her I'm going to give her back $1 a day every day, right? She gave me five bucks. She made back her $5 within five days. That's a pretty high rate of return. But let's say Jabari gives me $5,000 and I'm going to give him back $1 a day every day. Who's going to get their money back faster? Takara. Yep. Because she's got the lower investment in. But let's say that rate of rehearsal, so her rate of return is going to be higher on just the cash on cash. So the purpose is you put it, you want to be careful on your loan to value. Like if you do too much leverage where on a million dollar property, you put in 10%, that's that balance of, I need to put in enough to make sure it cash flows all while still using OPM, which is other people's money, the bank's money. That's why I tell you guys, savers will never win the money game. If you just a stockpile in cash over a 20 year period, you're losing. Because remember, like I said, the bank blows you up about putting your money in the in the savings account. But cash on a bank's balance sheet is a liability. And when I first read that, I'm like, I couldn't wrap my mind around it. But I'm like, when we give them our cash, they have to go loan it out to developers and investors and people buying two things. They usually like to give their money to people doing really two things, buying businesses and buying income producing real estate. That's why when we get into the investment piece, I'm going to show y'all how to buy real estate, any real estate you want, self-storage, apartments, new builder homes, townhomes, developments, condos, whatever you want to do in real estate investing, I'm gonna, it's going to be in that course. And then in the entrepreneur piece, I'm going to show you how to buy businesses. And so what you do is you take your real estate sales income, you put it back, you go buy real estate, you go buy businesses. That's how you build wealth. Hey, Terrence, if you're trying to do your first investment and you have equity in your house, would you say that's a a good way to get started or what's your thought on that? Yes, ma'am. I think you want to keep your loan value right, right? Because you don't, I know people that have done home equity loans and then got upside down. You don't want to mess with the, with the, with the, with the wolf den. Like you want to keep the den safe for the cubs. And now if you got really good equity in the house, let's say you bought it for 200 grand, but it's, it was worth and now it's worth 550. You want to keep your loan to value at a good ratio. Like you really want to be at 50, 50, 60, 40, 70, 30, 80, 20 at worst case. You see people pull equity out and now they're, they only have 10% equity in their house. You don't want to get unbalanced. And that's the same with when you're investing. You just want to make sure you keep good loan, loan to value ratios. Cause if the market does turn, your ratios need to be right. Cause if they get out of whack, that's when those bankers call on the loan, they balloon them. And y'all know if you stick a pin in a balloon, what does it do? It pops. So if it pops, then that means they want their note. They call it due immediately. And that's how everybody got upside down before in the market. Awesome. Thank you. I'm excited about the investment course. Oh, it's going to be Perfect. fire. That's, that's going to be my real legacy. This one right now I'm doing, I'm just doing it for y'all and the organization and the people who need it. But the one I'm really pumped about is the last two. When you first started, um, how did you get bankers and investors to trust you with um, 
their investments or them you raising capital? I didn't raise any capital. I just started raising capital like 15, 16 years later. So I just bootstrapped everything. What people don't realize is, and I've said this before, me and Erica wouldn't, we didn't go out to eat for two years and I ate sack lunches for two years straight. I literally ate a ham sandwich and Cheetos and some fruit every fucking day for two years. And so now I would eat dinner at home and she would, we, I would eat breakfast, but for my lunch, I didn't eat out. And that was a sacrifice that we made because we said everything we make, we're putting back to go invest. And so I'm saying is there's always, if where there's a will, there's a way. It's the same thing I told Dylan the other day. If I could do it all over again, which I can't, and I'm not looking at it like hindsight 2020, but man, I would buy a home or a duplex or a triplex or a fourplex, one to four single family. And I would get a conventional 5% down or I would get an FHA 3.5% down and I would buy this investment. I would move in one side. I would rent out the other. And I would do that every 12 months until I had a million dollar portfolio. So you got to think if you buy a $250,000 house or duplex or triplex or fourplex once a year for four years, let's just do the math real quick. Y'all ready? So 250,000, let's just say times 5%. That's 12 grand. And at 250,000, Times 0.035, that's eight grand. 87.50 or eight grand, that, that's a commission or two for y'all. If you're, you know, the, you know, you gotta think like 168,000 is about 5,000 in commission sales price. So it's like, let's put back eight grand. Let's go find a 250,000. Well, we can't get 250,000. Okay, well then let's just say 300,000, whatever. And if you just, but for this example, you can move into it for 12 months if it's a single family and then move out of it and lease it and not have to lose your note. And if it's a duplex, as long as you, I think it's 12 to 16 months or 12 to 14 months or somewhere in that range. Um, and then just move out, do it again. And in four years, give or take, you now have a million dollars of property. And you know, they say, how are you, how do you become a millionaire? You either worth a million on net worth or you have assets over a million. There it is. If I could do it all over again, we never would have bought our home. And here's why we bought a house. I think we paid 285 or something, 275. We sold it five years later for 315 or 330. And if we had have taken those five years and bought a house every year with 3.5% down versus putting down 25% up front, we now would have had five properties. They would have been worth well over a million and something dollars versus having a house we paid 285 for that was worth 330 that we put 25% down on. Like that's the game. Now, if you have older kids, or you're, you know, it's this, this is something that, which, 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 whether you have older kids or not, everybody can make the sacrifice. But if you're young, not married, young kids, man, I would be, I would be knocking this out of the park right now. Thanks, Terrence. This confirmation. I've been trying to get my husband to do that. <laughs> he doesn't want to do it. It's a no brainer. No, that's good. <laughs> it's the same thing I said earlier. Make the sacrifice for a certain time period so that you can. The one thing my brother wrote me, I had two other brothers. Well, I have seven brothers, but two of them had made some decisions and ended up going to prison. We came from a really tough, tough neighborhood, tough background. But he used to write me all the time. He's a very smart guy. And he wrote me when I was in ninth grade. He said, he said, little brother, you have everything it takes to be great. But you got to do right now what no one else is willing to do in order to be able to do one day what no one else will be able to do. So what he was trying to get me to understand is make these sacrifices right now so that you can live different down the road. And I remember I just kept reading that over and over and over in that letter. I got it in my soul and in my spirit. And that's why I made that commitment right then and there. I'm not going to drink. I'm not going to smoke. I didn't drink one drop throughout high school and college. I didn't smoke. And when guys were out hanging out, partying, I was grinding. That's how I got drafted in the first two rounds. It changed my life. So what are you guys willing to sacrifice right now in order to get where you're trying to go? Like I told y'all earlier, I ate, I ate sack lunches for two years straight. Brown bag. Well, it's like, well, how much more are you going? Are you really going to save? Man, the lunches are getting 20 bucks, 30 bucks, 40, 50 bucks, five, six days a week as of over time. But for me, it was more the discipline. Yeah. I mean, I, what I did is um, if I wanted to meet with clients, I met them at my office. I didn't go on a lot of lunches. I was reading. I literally, what I made a commitment is I'm going to eat these sack lunches and I'm going to read a book every lunch period. We'd already been doing it as kids. We went to the same <laughs> free lunch cafeteria. I was on free lunch every so it's like, I just pivoted the mindset. Eat these brown bags. I've been doing it already. But see, what people don't realize, I'll say this and I'll get out of here. I've been a millionaire since I was 22 years old. I became a millionaire at 22. I'm not saying this to sound cool because I don't care about that. 
but I became a millionaire at 22. But so you would look at that scenario and say, well, man, why are you eating sack lunches if you're a millionaire? Because I knew when I became 40 one day, I wanted to semi-retire. So it was just a sacrifice I was willing to make to get where I was trying to go. Any final questions? We good? Yeah, y'all. It's all a mindset. You can do everything that God is putting in your heart. You can achieve everything that God is putting in your heart. It's just what price are you willing to pay? Because you will pay a, pay a price. Nothing successful is going to come easy and nothing worthwhile is going to happen overnight. So that's why when I send my retire in December and people see me working three days a week, they're going to think that, oh, well, he only did that because he played in the NFL. I played in the NFL one year of my life. I only got paid to play football one year. I've been playing. I played football for hell 16 years. So, no, it's all the other things that I've done and the sacrifices I made to be able to sit my retire at 39 years old or 40, I guess, in December. So that's my encouragement to you. What price are you willing to pay to get where you're trying to go? Because it's all out there. You just got to do it. Proud Thank of y'all, man. I think this, I think this it, was, was a really, really good um, ask me anything. This one hit a little bit different. Appreciate you. Yeah, you got my mind over here spinning. I'm like, we can move out this house tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, man. It's kind of like I said on that one video, when my video guy was there capturing me talking to y'all on Clubhouse. Like, if we don't do it, who will? Who's going to be the person in our generational lineage to slay the dragon? Because I tell you what, I don't want to get called home and then my son got to be the person that's got to slay the dragon. No, it's going to be me. I'm going to slay the dragon and break these generational curses. I ain't looking at nobody else but me. I'm going to stop this. What's been going on in my family lineage year after year, you know, cycle after cycle, decade after decade, where everybody walking around just saying, this is where we from, bro. This is this how it's meant to be. Man, fuck that. It ain't how it's meant to be. We finna break this generational curse. And it takes a certain mindset to be willing to attack. I'm on attack mode every day. I realize in life, you truly, truly can do whatever you want to do and take whatever you want to take, be whoever you want to be, if you're willing to pay the price. But it starts in the mind and it starts in the mirror. But I will not leave this to my babies to have to stop what's been happening generation after generation. It's on me. It's going to take that mindset. It's going to take the mentality to, to be different and be uncomfortable. Y'all are going to be my legacy one day, man. One day God going to call me home, but these videos will be here. And y'all keep, y'all keep carrying the torch. You got to remember each and every one of y'all have a sphere of influence. Each and every one of y'all in this room has people watching you. Your babies are watching you. Your spouses are watching you. Your, your siblings are watching you. There's people in your community that knows your testimony and knows your story. They're watching you. And they're waiting to see if you slay the dragon. So go slay it. But you got to be different. And you won't be able to do what everybody else is doing. It's the only way greatness is achieved. Go study Kobe Bryant. Go study Michael Jordan. Go study Tiger Woods. It's not even about sports. It's about the fact that when you listen to them talk, they move in different. Because if they move like everybody else, they would be back where they came from. You got to be different. We already know what the results are going to be if we do what all other realtors are doing. Y'all heard the statistics. 50% of agents are out of it, out of the business by year one. 50% of agents that make it to year two are out of the business by year two. And by year three, only 25% make it to year three. And by year five, only 13%. So we know the stats are there. So we got to be different. We got to move different. And then let's just, I, I guarantee you, if you took that 13% of agents that made it to year five, I guarantee a lot, I guarantee you 95% of them don't have an exit strategy. That's where we're trying to go. Get to a place where you pick and choose what clients you want to work, work with. But it takes time. All right, y'all. Proud of y'all. Love y'all. I'll see y'all soon. <laughs>